three, two, one. And the light of a single torch illuminated the whole room, glinting off countless fragments of silicon. <laughs> Welcome to another installment of Fragments of Silicon European Interviews. Uh, first one of these in a while, not from a lack of trying, uh, but anyway. Uh, so I know what the Chiron says and what the episode uh, listing says, but uh, we had a bit of a last minute um, alteration. Uh, that is to say, one of our guests here isn't here because he had a meeting to go to at this particular moment in time. Like, um, he might be along later. I'm told the meeting is about 20, 30 minutes. You know, um, we'll see what happens. But in the meantime, we do have, uh, you know, the other guy. Uh, we have Imikan Hayatai of uh, Upstream Arcade with us. Hi there. Yes. Um, I suppose we should just get into it. Um, all right. Um, so we usually start by asking our guests uh, how they got interested in this whole business in the uh, first place, both in terms of you know video games in general and um, video games as a business. Um. Okay. So um, yeah, I was always interested in games as a as a kid. Me, me and sort of. Um, friends at school used to always kind of design our own um uh, our own game ideas um but it wasn't really until i was at university studying something different um i was studying architecture at, at the time actually um the um one of my housemates he was uh, uh he had a nintendo 64 uh, and i used to play it most of the time and uh the game that I started playing was Ocarina of Time, and then uh, for, sort of from that moment on, um, I knew I wanted to get into uh, computer games. Um, uh, so that's how I uh, sort of uh, my thought process went into into games, and um, and uh, after that, um, uh, I kind of uh, studied computer animation for a bit. Um, and then um, got my first games job um, at a small Game Boy Advance developer um, called Pucker Games years ago, um, and that's kind of how sort of things kicked off, really. Oh, wow. we don't get too many people who did um, like uh, Game Boy Advance work, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, uh, it's like. I do have to ask, what was it like uh, making games for the platform? Is it like, and what what kind of games did you make? Was it licensed fair? Um, yeah, so, so, so um, we were a small team, um, so, so I think we were about eight to ten people. So it's, it was quite good fun because um, mm -hmm. uh, we were a small team. Um, kind of got to learn, uh, especially considering it was my first. Uh, games job um it was it, it was great because i was learning loads of different aspects and because i was close to everyone it was kind of learning a bit of the management side of things um and uh, the the games generally that uh the company did were licenses um it, it was quite quite tough um trying to, to to get sort of your own games onto gba um and um uh, but yeah, it was uh, it, it was quite an experience, really. I can imagine. Uh, uh, how many games did you make for the platform, and can you name any of them, or is that kind of still under wraps? Um. So, uh, yeah, un unfortunately, um, 
the the company sort of uh, there, there wasn't really much publisher support at the time. It was kind of um, getting to the end of sort of the GBA period uh, when I was working um, on it, and um, so so there wasn't really much publisher support for smaller teams, uh, and and so I, w I was working six months on a project which I'm unfortunately didn't see the light of day um uh so although i got all that experience i didn't actually get uh, sort of a, a title out uh i suppose that's unfortunate uh, yeah uh, uh so did you stay with the, this company like post gba or did you move elsewhere uh so so after after that, um, so the company completely sort of folded, and um, uh, so had to had to look anyway uh, elsewhere. And um, uh, and uh, luckily, I found a job at, at Lionhead, and I was working on Black and White Two, uh, doing environment art, um, and then um, sort of branched out into all, all different types of art so, so ended up doing characters and concepts and stuff for the game um and then after that uh, i moved on to uh, rockstar games um i went to their vienna office uh they had an office there uh, for a while and um there i worked on uh max Payne 3 that's what they were doing there at, at the time um unfortunately that was another closure um uh, so again, I had to look look for work after uh, after Rockstar Games as well. Mm. Um, like yeah, and those are some pretty uh, high profile titles there. Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I enjoyed both those uh, places to work and the games I worked on. Thoroughly in, in, enjoyed it and um, and. Uh, Different experiences, obviously. Sort of Black and White Two was completely different to to, to Max Payne Three, and um, and uh, yeah. After that, I could kind of I moved on and, and worked for quite a number of companies uh, after that um, uh, until finally, obviously, it got to this stage where um, I'm doing something with uh, my friend Adam and, and, and working on our own games. Indeed, and um, when did you first meet your business partner? Um, actually, the, the the first time we, we met was on on Black and White Two all those years ago um, uh, at Lionhead. Um, so we we worked closely together um, uh, on the VFX uh, for the game. So we did a, a lot of. Uh, he was doing uh, the code side. Uh, I was doing the art side, and. Um, yeah, we did all, all the spells and everything to do w with that stuff, and and um, and then we, we didn't sort of meet up until kind of the the last company we were working uh, for, which was um, Wonderstruck or Turbulence, um, and uh, there we, we we sort of met up, and then um, from there we we decided we, we'd like to set something up ourselves. Uh, so finally moving into the indie territory. Yeah, that's right. It's not an uncommon uh, refrain I've heard from those who have moved from like AAA development into the indie sector. Uh, they wanted to make something for themselves. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, um, working on sort of uh, Deadbeat Heroes was, was great fun. We, we kind of... It's got... Uh, the cool thing about it, it's got sort of a piece of ourselves in it it's, it's kind of um we like that type of humor and, and we're into that type of stuff so so it's quite cool for finally doing something that we're completely putting our own selves into it so um the idea for deadbeat heroes was this something that you came up with um like uh, just a couple of years ago or is this a thread that you might have come up with like back in the black and white days um, I th well, it, it actually sort of uh, started a couple of years ago, actually, uh, and um, and uh, uh, it was whilst we were working in 
uh, at Wonderstruck. We, we were sort of sort of in a coffee shop, chatting away. We usually talk about stuff we like and uh, and things, and it it just kind of cropped up uh, this idea about this sort of kind of ordinary Joe type guy who doesn't have powers of his own and and how it would be cool that he'd, he'd be able to steal powers and uh, and um, and then use them himself and, and and become somewhat super and 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 that kind of got our imaginations going about it and and uh, and and that's kind of how it sort of started really Right, and uh, for the uninitiated, uh, what is Deadbeat Heroes exactly? Uh, so, so it's a it's a three D brawler. Um, uh, it's a, it's a movement based brawler. So, so so there's no kind of block button. Um, the, the the way you defend yourself is by moving around and using your environment either by wall running or, or dashing. Uh, and that's how you kind of um, confuse your enemies and then get hits on them. So, so, it, so it, strong really, anti-turtling measures. So it's really kind of yeah. Try to build your your um, uh, your your combos and uh, and get a higher score. Uh, I think if this game reminded me of any other game, it was. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever played this one, uh, Beautiful Joe. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I have. <laughs> like uh, that one was, uh, even though it was a purely 2D affair, it, it was based mm. around combos and uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, for, from kind of visually, we. we, we um, Kind of references and so on. Um, Beautiful Joe was one of uh, kind of the references references we looked at, and um, mm. also kind of Jet Set Radio and and, and stuff like that, that, just to get sort of visual influences. And and yeah, I, I loved Beautiful Joe and, and and playing it. So yeah, completely aware of uh, of that game. Right. Um, so another question I have is why the seventy? Uh, so, uh, the the idea of the game was kind of the de demise of of kind of your classic superheroes. So, kind of nineteen fifties was kind of uh, when's the golden age of of uh, your classic superheroes, and and now it's kind of slowly degrading, and and a lot of the heroes are either dying off. Um, and and the idea is um, that that period would be kind of around the 60s, um, and and then there's kind of gangs with guns, and it's 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 kind of time is changing. Um, the reason we picked 1970 in particular was um, so that we could use influences from from both the 60s and the 70s. So for example, uh, a couple of the characters. Um, are designed kind of looking a bit more 60s and a couple of the characters look a bit more 70s. So, so it's just to give us that bit of freedom. We went for 1970 in, in speci as a specific date um, or, or year. Um, but it's, it's kind of to capture that, that age after the, the golden age of heroes, really. Hmm. I'm like, uh, let's see, 1970, then... Probably be uh, the Silver Age of superheroes, mm -hmm. yeah. and like later on in the seventies, it's the Bronze Age, like, right? Or the Dark Age, depending on who you ask. No, the, the Dark Age of superheroes came in the mid eighties, like, and the differentiator is not just time but tone. Like the, the 19... The Silver Age is known as the ultra goofy period. No, this this is the period where um, statues come to life and no one blinks an eye. Just, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, like you're, you're gonna have Batman fighting the statue of Abraham Lincoln, and right. 
it's not an Elseworld tale or like the, 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 the Silver Age is really goofy. I'm, excuse me, I think you're forgetting that it's Bat Baby that fights the statue of Abraham Lincoln, good sir. <laughs> yeah, oh, probably, sweet God. <laughs> you're probably right there. And then something, oh. something, Bat Cow. Yeah, uh, I'm like... And then Superman comes around and then shoots out many Supermen from his fingers. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm going to need to start drinking in to block that one out again. Thanks, Ogre. Uh, I'm like, it, it's really hard to describe just how insane the Silver Age is. Mm-hmm. I'm like, and the Bronze Age, well, that's more marked by um, social issues. Um, you know, that's when it was starting to deal with, you know, Bucky is a heroin addict and that kind of deal. Green Lantern and Green Arrow. One's yeah. a conservative, one's a liberal, and they hate each other. <laughs> Tune in this Saturday on ABC. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> and you know, the Dark Age, that, that's Watchmen and the Dark Knight Returns, you know, deconstructing what it means to be a superhero and all that stuff. And Also you know, that, way too many pouches. Yeah, and it's like, well, that goes full on into the 90s. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, but anyway... I'm like, though I do have to ask, um, how much did you draw from, like, American comics, and how much did you draw from, you know, British uh, stuff? Um, well, I, I guess, uh, so, sort of, the biggest influence, really, on on the game um, is the uh, 60s Batman TV series. Um, that, that, kind of, the... Um, the kind of bright colors, uh, also a bit of that humor, the wackiness of the villains, and and, and things like that. Well, uh, a lot of those influences came from from that. Um, so so in a way, uh, that was kind of uh, the American <laughs> uh, sort of. Well, I wouldn't say comic book scene, but um, that was kind of the bit of American stuff that we drew on. Um, uh, and the rest of it w- was kind of, uh, yeah, b- a bit, uh, a bit of sort of James Bondy, w- w- especially with the the main hero um, Felix. Um, uh, so, yeah, w- we wanted to bring that British uh, humour and 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 see how that sixties Batman would have been if if we kind of took it and make it more British sort of thing. Isn't that the Avengers? Uh, I guess so, because uh, that was another kind of reference we did look at as well was the Avengers. Um so um yeah the Avengers, uh James Bond sort of from the British side of things. Um, that, that we kind of brought into it as well, yeah. That makes sense. I mean, one of the... I assume the Batman uh, right down to the... Like, it's got a Dutch angle um, from you know, looking at the footage here. <laughs> anyway, um, so how long did it take you to make Deadbeat Heroes? Uh, so... The the team is uh, pretty much Adams the coder and uh, I'm the artist. We ha- we had um, a writer uh, on board who, who was uh, um, freelancing for us, so he, he was part time, um, and uh, we had a part time uh, animator as as well on board. So um, there were only really four of us and two, two of us full time. And it took us just, uh, yeah, around two years to to finish that's, off. That's a pretty typical development cycle, like especially since you know this game is a bit more complex than, uh, say, maybe a roguelike or a two D platform game. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we, we, re- we really had to c- kind of get the schedule right and, and, and get it all so, sort of um, 
all the features that that we wanted in and 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 all the contents so, so it was quite yeah it was, a, it was quite a roller coaster ride really i can imagine um so how does the division of labor work um as in what did you work on and what did adam work on uh so, so um adam did uh, um oh, we were using unity as, a, as the main engine um and adam built um tools and uh, and did gameplay um all the gameplay code uh he did the porting and so on um i did uh, all the art, um, so the VFX, the characters, the environments, props, and um, and then um, the animator was um, uh, did the rigging and the animation. Um, so so that's pretty much how um, how it's split up. Okay, uh, do have to interrupt this for a bit um, as Adam is ready to come aboard. Oh boy. Hi. 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 Plus, we, we much prefer to show the game uh, mm -hmm. when we're broadcasting. Uh, hang on, I don't think I've given you a link yet. Um, oh, right, I'll have to have a... Anyway, um, uh, did your meeting go well? Yes, it was good, thank you. Oh, Amy, you've let them in on it. Yeah, I had a good meeting. Yeah, it went well. All right. All right, so I'm um, going to have to rewind a bit on our questions because you haven't been here and um, you know, we've gotten to know your business partner, but not you yet. Um, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, well, I'd like to ask you is, um, how did you get interested into video games, both as, you know, uh, a passion and as a business? Oh, wow, okay. So, it was always passion first, um, and I, here's, here's my sort of boring story. I grew up in a town called Bognor Regis, which I'm not sure anyone in America has ever heard of, but it's like this very quaint old seaside town um and when i grew up um i wasn't allowed i never had a console growing up but we had good arcades down by the sea um so what i would do is i'd spend a lot of my my paper round money i'd head down to the beach and then spend it on street fighter 2 or whatever was out there at the time and that was quite a large part like the birth of my sort of passion for video games really through the arcades um that's kind of what got me into it um and then i was always interested from then on but it never seemed like something that i could do as a career so i i kind of forgot about it as a, in fact uh, i wanted to be a video games artist but there was no such job at the time this was in the 90s and um I, I think at the time, people that made games made a whole game, nearly all the time. Um, so then I went and did my degree, and I, I was, did a degree in engineering, and then I kind of decided, actually, I really would like to try and make it as a video game artist. So I just hassled lots and lots of games companies uh, for an internship, and finally got into Bullfrog slash EA at the time um, and, and got there and th I think that was my foot in the door really. The rest is history. Oh, wow, you worked at Bullfrog. Yeah, it was really, it was like a, a really strange uh, like level of excitement and slight disappointment even though it was amazing there because I arrived at Bullfrog and I had my head full of Bullfrog stuff and it was just after EA had bought Bullfrog. So I was led through the studio and I was looking around, it was all amazing. And they said, yeah, you're gonna be working on our new game, F1 2000 Championship Edition. <laughs> and I was thought, That's, that doesn't sound like a Bullfrog game I've heard of. 
and um, it was it was the first wave of EA's kind of cool sports games that they were doing there. Um, but it wasn't really my cup of tea at the time. I was just a bit surprised. I, I, I'm like, I don't even know what to say to that. Like, and then yeah, that sounds like what, something EA would do. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, I mean no, nothing against them. It was a really good team, mm -hmm. and they were doing awesome work. Um, I was, it was just a, a little bit of a disappointment on my geek radar, really, when I first got there. No, I get, I, I get it, I get it. When you think of Bullfrog, you think of what Dungeon Keeper, Populous. Uh, absolutely, you know, yeah. You know, not so much F1, but no, no, that's right. Uh, uh, so, how long did you last at uh, Bullfrog? Well, I, I lasted for the full internship, which was only six months. Yeah. Um, and then I went back and finished off my degree for the last year. And then I kind of got back into a Guildford Games company, which was called Small Rockets. And they had this kind of very ahead of their time idea of making games that you could download from the internet to play. And that was like a new thing at the time. And um, then there were some people there that when that, that then went over to Lionhead to work on the movies, and I just rode their coattails all the way over. So I, I remember interviewing for Black and White 2, I think, and the guy that interviewed me was a, a really great guy called John T. Barnes, who's over at Bungie now, and he said, yeah, you're a risk, but you're an interesting risk, so, and that's how I got in. Did he ever elaborate on what he meant by risk? No, I, I never asked after that. I thought, I don't want to know the answer to that. Fair enough. I think it may have been because I was wanted to do art and programming at the same time. And then I kind of settled for programming, eventually. Well, uh, so it goes, I suppose. I mean, hello. Um, so did you work on anything else besides Black and White 2? Yeah, so Black and White 2 was our, our first title, um, Imi and myself at Lionhead. And then, um, after Black and White 2, I did a load of R&D at Lionhead. So I I was part of the, the second R&D department. The first R&D department turned into Media Molecule. And so we had some very big shoes to fill. And um, I did a lot of sort of gameplay prototyping, stuff like that. Um, where ended up doing combat stuff for Fable 2, and then when Kinect started, or at the time it was called Project Natal, um, got our hands on all that stuff, did loads of R&D with that, and Milo and Kate, and then Fable the Journey, and then le left and went off and did um, other stuff at other companies. Mm. Like... Uh, it is unfortunate that Lionhead is no longer with us. Yeah, it's absolutely, it's, it's completely gutting. It's it's a real kind of cornerstone of the development scene over over here, especially in Guildford. Like um, Bullfrog was where was was the biggest game game company to my mind in Guildford, and then and then Lionhead was, and. Now it's all over the place. But the nice thing is, the, those companies are great at attracting talent from a long, from all around. Uh, right. But that talent doesn't always just disappear back to where they came from before. Uh, it just mills around and turns into new startup studios. So it's a really interesting area um, to work around. There's, there's always new companies and really talented people doing cool new stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we encounter them fairly regularly. Like, <laughs> uh, the indie scene is quite big here in the year of 2017. Like, mm. uh, but anyway, speaking of which, uh, what exactly prompted you to move to the indie circuit versus, you know, staying in the AAA field? Oh, I, uh, I'm sure my idea, my answer will just echo Indies, but I... I mean, I think it's very much a lot of people's passion to make something that they think is kind of theirs or something that they feel a, a very deep connection to. And um, 
I was always interested in working in small teams because you kind of get to do a bit of everything. You get to learn more and you also get to kind of design a bit more of the game and you, you get to kind of make the game a bit more personal to you. And that's the draw for indie for me um, massively. It's amazing working on bigger games with bigger teams and being surrounded by fantastically clever people. But at the same time, it's really cool being able to potter away on a passion project like Imi and I get to, which is a real privilege. Indeed. I'm like, uh, that's another common sentiment I've heard from other developers. You know, the, th the thing that they are working on is usually what they want to be working on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think with the games industry, especially with a lot of, say, programmers, um, every programmer in the games industry really wants to make games. Uh, that's that's what I've noticed, and they, and almost from a kind of a materialistic point of view, a lot of these guys have turned down or uh, more lucrative jobs in other industries. So they they are taking a pay cut just to be around people that are making games and just to be in this kind of industry. Um, so, like, it's already you know that there's a lot of people who are, and, and having said that, this isn't limited to programmers. Like, everyone in the games industry really, really wants to be there because it's hard um, and it's kind of scary as well. Um, but the, the jump from going to uh, big company games industry work to indie games industry work uh, felt like a no-brainer at the time. It was just so much more what we wanted to do. Right, and um, so right before we were uh, you uh, joined us, we were talking about um, how this game was conceptualized and all the influences that went into it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, was there anything that um, you were uh, influenced by in terms of games or comics that uh, you added to this mix? Oh, uh, so I'm not sure what Emmy's list was, but I'm sure it included Batman TV series from the 60s. Yeah. Um, and maybe Beautiful Joe, was that in there, Emmy? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, there was a couple of games that uh, inspired me, and they're both, two of them, they're both Dreamcast games. And one was Jet Set Radio, which pioneered the cell shaded look and did a fantastic job of its sense of mood and tone. And the other game is also on Dreamcast, which is Power Stone. And like I, I passionately believe and still hold that Power Stone was the first and best true 3D fighting game. Um, I'm sure, I know that there was Virtua Fighter and Tekken, but in terms of gameplay, they're kind of two and a half D they're kind of just two planes, and there's a little bit of in and out of the planes. Whereas Power Stone was just incredible in how it completely embraced almost other genres in terms of its platforming and interaction with the environment. And in some ways, Deadbeat Heroes is a bit of a love letter to some of those mechanics. Obviously, we try to bring our own stuff to it as much as possible. Um, but some of the basics of run around, jump, hit stuff, um, is very much inspired from Power Stone. Yeah, now that you bring it up, I can see uh, the influence. Uh, it, it's been an age and a half since I played Power Stone. Oh, yeah, it's, it, still ha it still holds up. It's great. Uh, I'm like, I, w uh, I wish that no a third one had been made, but uh, it never did. I'm not exactly holding out hope that that will happen anytime, ever. But uh, well, to be honest, part, that's part of the reason why we made this one, <laughs> as well. <laughs> we were just itching to play something new, a bit like it, um, so we decided to make it ourselves. Hmm. Indeed. Now, uh, uh, this game is combo focused. Uh, mm -hmm. No. Um, so how does that work out exactly in terms of? Uh, mechanics. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. So the we always try and describe uh, Deadbeat Heroes as 
a movement based brawler. And what we try to do in design terms is look at mechanics that already exist in fights and games that people understand, attacking, defending, uh, and combos, and then try to kind of reimagine them from a basis of um, movement being your main tool. So, for example, there isn't a block button. If somebody hits you or tries to hit you, movement is your way to defend, and you do that by dodging out of the way or running along a wall to go over bullets and things like that. Um, and equally with combos, um, usually uh, it's saying Street Fighter, the way to do a combo is you, you memorize and rehearse the button combinations and timings of a string of attacks. And that's not quite, that doesn't really work the same with Deadbeat Heroes. With, with Deadbeat Heroes, the way that you do combos is a little bit looser. Um, it's not a combo in the sense of it's an unblockable chain of attacks. It's more of a combo in terms, of, it's, it's more like a chain. So you, you get to, we try and reward you for getting a string of attacks in a short space of time. But the way to do that, and actually it is kind of a combo as well, um, when it comes to uh, juggles and ricochets, is the way to do that is when you hit someone, they usually fly away a fair distance. And if you want to do a combo on that person, you need to hit them again before they hit the ground. And that is again all through the, the lens of movement. You need to run up to get closer to them again. Or if they bounce off the wall, maybe you jump up in the air and hit them before they hit the ground again. Or if you've used the uppercut move and you hit them up into the air, you have to jump up and then hit them again. So things that are usually like really advanced maneuvers in say Street Fighter, where you bounce someone off a wall and hit them again, or you juggle them before they hit the ground, is, is actually our bread and butter combo system, uh, which kind of makes it a bit sillier and more over the top. Yeah, I definitely experienced that, and honestly, that kind of works with my play style because I I hate block buttons. Like, I, I never remember to hit them when I'm kind of attacking, so. I know what you mean. I, I mean, I always kind of feel a lot cooler dodging than blocking as well. So for the kind of characters and the feel that we wanted, this like Felix guy with this crazy glove, we, it always seemed a lot cooler for him to be dodging around bullets rather than absorbing them somehow. Right. Um, so is there any particular incentive for, uh, say, S-ranking? A level like uh, are there any sort of uh, either rewards or leaderboards uh, unfortunately we didn't get around to leaderboards so s ranking is kind of for, for bragging rights and giving yourself a pat on the back <laughs> at the moment um, but yeah I mean we've we've been looking at the balance of that and we still keep we've been looking at trying to retune the ranking balance but the s ranking is staying exactly where it is we want that to be a real tricky a real tough challenge. Um, so yeah, if you get S ranking, especially later in the game, uh, hats off to you. Like we, we think you're cool. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, now, this game is available for the PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One, correct? Uh, not the PlayStation 4, unfortunately, oh. but yeah, play, uh, PC and Xbox One. Uh, I didn't realize there was usually. I'm so used to these things having those three platforms that it's always a bit of an iron battle race when it misses one of them. Oh, I know what you mean. I was, um, from an insider point of, of view, I was well up for doing all, all the console, all the different console launches. Um, but I am the entire programming team. Um, and then, of, of course, a couple of months into getting it all working on the Xbox One. I, I was definitely uh, not a, I would not have had the bandwidth to support another platform as well. Unfortunately, I'm just not clever enough. <laughs> that does make sense. Uh, you know, like... <laughs> yep, sounds like it, Adam. You certainly do not sound clever enough. No, 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 no. In the sense of not being able to support a third platform. You know, once yeah, again. yeah. I mean, it's, 
it's, it's a shame it's something that we we'd love to do um but yeah we, we weren't able to land it on this one yet yeah so was there a particular reason you chose the xbox one Oh, that was actually a decision that was kind of in partnership with uh, with our publishers, um, mm. and I don't. I'm not going to really go into the in, the, the details of that decision, um, but uh, but yeah, we, we kind of thought that was the best way to go at you know at the time for sure. Okay, and speaking of which, how did you hook up with the collective? Well, we had a um, it was very lucky and it was quite surprising as well so we went to a a guildford game event called uh rocket jump which there's another one actually uh this month so there's another rocket jump in guildford if anyone's listening go there um but the previous one we went to um it's a, a few talks by people in the industry and we were invited to show debbie heroes because we were we were at the courting publisher phase and um, what we and we had a terrible, terrible time. Um, we we forgot screwdrivers, so we couldn't assemble the TV. And by the time we'd got everything ready, um, it was too late. And they started doing the presentations. So we sat in the audience, drinking and grumbling about how no one's even played Deadbeat Heroes yet. And one of the people giving the presentation was Phil Elliott from uh, Square Enix, and he did a great. Uh, presentation and we were complaining to each other saying this is the kind of guy we want to be talking to and he hasn't even played the game and um, after a load of grumbling right at the end of the event Phil was just leaving the door um, leaving you know leaving the place where it was all being held and someone said go on just just grab him quickly so he had his hand on the door and mm. I I just grabbed him put my hand on your shoulder and said hello Phil come and look at this and luckily uh, for us, he liked what he saw. Luckily, so he, he didn't was... call security. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, we, we had had such a, a, a bad luck evening, and we were so grumpy about the whole thing. And it turned out to be a really good stroke of luck on our part. So, yeah, we weren't expecting anywhere near that kind of result. With events, it always seems like potluck. And I think that's, that definitely proves it. Uh, indeed. That... That's certainly a story, like, you know, and yeah, and it's good that it all worked out for you. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, we we were very you know happy to to partner up with those guys. Well, yeah, uh, I'm like, we know Phil. Uh, he's been on a show a number of times actually. Like, oh cool. Yeah, <laughs> and we've done a whole bunch of interviews with other collective. Um, uh, developers. Now, in fact, you're like our fourth of the season. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. So you've, you've met all of our stable mates then. <laughs> There's some of them. Let's see. Uh, there was uh, Sailor Sand Studio. They opened up the season. Like, uh, we just interviewed Sushi a few weeks ago. Oh, like, great. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and I'm trying to remember who the other one was. Oh, right. Uh, Cardboard Utopia, Children of the Zodiacs. Oh yeah, that that's a beautifully presented game. Really, really good. <laughs> well, I mean, we uh, we like what they do um, because you know it's a harsh world out there for indie developers. Mm. It's like, I mean, hell, uh, you know, uh, a notable indie studio just died a couple of days ago. Oh no. I'm like, and we knew people there. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, uh, I'm like, I, I feel bad for them, you know, especially mm. since we've been doing business with them for years, and you know, it's disparaging to see that the the project that they got released was, uh, you know, just didn't take in the market or whatever. Yeah, no, it's it's, well, it's certainly it's certainly tough out there for sure, and. The, um, it's always a mixed blessing. Things like Unity, which is um, an absolute godsend in terms of development, um, it, it massively lowers the barriers for people making games, which is great. The bottom line of it is it's fantastic. But if you're already in that group of people making games, 
it's just got more crowded for you as well so it makes it tougher yeah. um so it's yeah it's it's not easy out there for sure yeah and um square enix is really the only you know publisher um doing something like the collective i mean i know mm. they're like dedicated indie publishers like uh, devolver and such but you know from a triple a perspective there's nobody that's like actively supporting the community like square enix is so. yeah absolutely no i mean hats off to them they i mean they're very passionate about mm. their indie games and we really really love working with them yeah it's one reason why we like having phil on the program he's very passionate about the indie scene mm. and anyway so how has your game been faring uh, out there uh in the i don't know month it's been out yeah, it's been going well. We've we've been getting some loads of feedback. All feedback is golden, and we've had some. It's always really lovely when you when you read the good stuff, and that's been great. Um, and we also picked up a few reviews where there was a blind spot that we just had we did not you know catch before we released the game, and it was to do with the, the way that the flow worked. But if you failed a level, it would kind of rewind progress. And um, and of course, in hindsight, that was that was a bad idea. I'm not sure that was the right way to go. But the good thing was, um, even it was actually more useful uh, that feedback because we could very easily change it, and and we just changed that as soon as we as soon as we spotted this this little blind spot of ours. Um, so that's been really really useful as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's our little baby's out there faring for itself. And it's just great to, you know, read the nice stuff that people think about it. And it's great to see people playing it at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, if I may offer some advice uh, myself, one thing I noticed was lacking was a quit feature if you're in, in a mission. Like, yes. Yeah. Yep. Thank see, yep. it, like, Because sometimes I would get hit and, you know, that kind of ruined the run. And mm -hmm. there was no way to reset that. Like, yeah, you're completely right. Oh dear, uh, I'm just I'm just touching and shaking my head at myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's like been there. Oh dear. Oh, well. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, it was something I noticed while I was playing. I'm like, wait, I can't exit this. <laughs> mm. I think what um, I'm not sure if that. I think what I did. There's no one to blame but me. Um, is you can go back to the start. Oh no, actually you're right. Is it is it before you've completed the mission before? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think we wanted you to always stick it out to the bitter end on your first time through. <laughs> that was, I think that was my thinking at the time. But it, yeah, it does seem like a, a bit of a, an omission for sure. Hmm. And um, something we haven't talked about yet is the music. Um, who came up with all the, for lack of a better term, funky beats? Oh, yeah. So it's a company called Pit Stop Productions. And um, we had never worked with them before. Um, but they were kind of recommended to us, and we, we got in touch. Funnily enough, I, was at, I actually thought I was just speaking to them about sound effects. And then it became really clear in our first conversation conversation that they had a, a band on tap and it just sounded like too good an opportunity to pass up so we, we got them doing the music straight away um, and yeah it's, it's been a really kind of almost a completely hands-off uh, experience for us we've had a few chats talked about our influences and they just completely got what the game was trying to be straight away and then lent into it and did a, a I mean I'm to my opinion, an amazing job of getting some, you know, cool, funky 60s, 70s tunes in there. Uh, it feels like I'm watching a 70s cop show with the soundtrack. Perfect. That's exactly <laughs> it. I figured that was kind of what it was going for. Like, and um, so is development um, complete on uh, Deadbeat Heroes? We've like, got a few, um, so yeah, we've got a few kind of um, additional uh, projects on 
deadbeat heroes that we're, we're looking at um, to do with kind of just continuing to improve it and um, and get people enjoying it. So th there's a couple of bits and bobs still in the pipeline, um, but we're not kind of ready to talk about them yet, <laughs> I'm afraid. Mm. Fair enough. And um, let's see. Uh, have you considered a Nintendo Switch version? I, I mean, I know why there wasn't a PlayStation 4 version, but... You know the Nintendo Switch is a, you know, a fairly new console, so mm. and you wouldn't have had the, uh, you know, the time to look into it while the game was in uh, development. Yeah, so that that came along really late in development, didn't it? So, um, yeah. well, we're, I mean, we're massive fans of everything that Nintendo always does. Um, so yeah, I mean, it would be a, a lovely, a lovely device for us to get Deadbeat Heroes onto. Um, I think it's going to be one of those things that we have a good chat about in the future and figure out what we can do. Yeah. And uh, let's see, finally, uh, multiplayer. Um, oh, yeah. This game is two-player multiplayer local, correct? That's right. Yeah. Um, was there ever any attempts to uh, make the multiplayer online? Well, I never, I never tried it, um, but it's, you know, the, the excuse I gave about it not being on many consoles it's, it's the same excuse about online multiplayer where as a feature it's one of those weird features where it seems it's very easy to imagine and describe online multiplayer i've said it easy peasy but getting online multiplayer to work for an action game is a big undertaking in terms of code um and you kind of need to rethink loads and loads of stuff about how you do stuff in the game almost from the bottom up um so this is our first uh game as our as our little team and um i've i've worked on multiplayer games before and they're not they're not simple and i'm not i'm not the smartest guy i know either so um i kind of chickened out of doing <laughs> online multiplayer but opted for couch co-op because that's Kind of simpler to implement but also it captures like the the co-op uh kind of gameplay um just you know better in a lot of ways um so we decided to opt for that hmm. yeah that that makes sense and it's also a matter of latency like uh mm. this is the kind of game where uh you can't really miss in terms of uh ping or else it's going to make the game unplayable. Oh yeah, it, it would. Yeah, I mean, any any lag on this would be absolutely disgraceful. I mean, it it would feel disgusting. So, and that's not that's not insurmountable at all. It's that's just another layer of cleverness that you would need that I that I would need to add on to the code to make sure it there's no lag. Um, well, there's no perceptible lag, uh, and it's completely. Um, it is solved. I mean, um, games like Street Fighter Online, they, they totally do it. Um, oh, there's, there's more of them. <laughs> there's more of them than our little code team of one. <laughs> right. Um, so we are getting low on time. So I think uh, I'll see if any of my colleagues have any last questions. Cool. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I think all my questions have been asked and answered, so anybody else? Uh, it looks pretty fun. I'm looking forward to trying it out. Hey! <laughs> yeah, we are planning to review the game on uh, Sunday. Oh, great. Well, are, are you enjoying it so far, not to spoil the yeah. review? Yeah, I, I've been enjoying it. Uh, you know, it, it seems uh, fairly uh, short, but it's uh, it's pretty polished as well. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Actually, I can't really take that much credit for that. That's more Emmy, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice game to uh, pick up and play for about a half an hour. I find like mm. you know, uh, work through a, a chapter, a session. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, yeah. I do find. Um, I think when we first started it, we imagined the level to take less than a minute, and then 
we we kind of it, it expands you a little bit underneath us. So I I do actually find the sustained intensity, especially later on, is something that I can handle for about half an hour, and then I think yeah I think I need a breather now actually. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's also to keep repetition from setting in because uh, you know every chapter is pretty much the same in terms of structure. You know you go through three levels of goons and then you fight a boss so. yeah yeah absolutely the, i mean the structure is kind of very predictable um what we were hoping to introduce or kind of alleviate the repetition is we kind of went a little bit over the top in terms of features so every chapter introduces a new goon a new superpower um and a new kind of obstacle or hazard actually mm-hmm. and we were the, the goal was to try and make sure that Almost every level, there's something new to try and learn and, and overcome. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, at any rate, I think uh, that's all we got for this session. So um, it was wonderful having you both on the program. Oh, thank you for having us. Yeah, um, thank you. No problem. No problem. Um, like I said, uh, been enjoying the game so far. You know, it's like. And um, we're certainly looking forward to whatever you have planned in the uh, future. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No problems. The game is Deadbeat Heroes. It's available now for the Xbox One. And um, in terms of PC, is it uh, just Windows or is it uh, Mac and Linux as well? Just Windows at the moment. Hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Not everyone can do the, you know, three computer versions at once. Like, yeah, sorry, sorry, Matt guys, sorry, Linux guys. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, it's available for uh, Windows and Xbox One, uh, going for fourteen ninety nine currently. Um, so pick it up today. And um, with, that, yeah, with that, be sure to tune in for our Wednesday show, where we'll be having Kevin Dressel of Shiny Dolphin Games. And I'm looking forward to it, and we hope you are as well. And until then, I wish you good gaming. Bye-bye.